Okay, so students, this would be a recorded video for Unit 3. This is intended for students who cannot attend our online lecture today, October 19, 2021. Okay, so we proceed. So, as you all know, one of the aims of higher education is to promote independent learning. When we say independent learning, an individual or a college student is curious, self-motivated, risk taker, and uh, there is initiative or he has initiative, he is resilient, he knows how to manage his time, he is reflective, and he is accountable for the actions that he is doing. And lastly, as an independent learner, a person is a critical thinker, meaning he does not only uh, he does not only accept information, but he tries to evaluate whether those information are relevant for him or her. Why are we promoting independent learning? Because we believe that it could promote academic persistence and cognitive and emotional as well as behavioral engagement among students. Okay, so as you all know, and from the previous recorded video on Kamustahan 2, COVID-19 is both a challenge and opportunity for us. It is a catalyst of change. Now that we are coping with COVID-19, educational technology is very important. We should be adapting to the new normal, the flexible learning strategy. In this way, there is really a need to become innovative, creative, and resourceful so that we may be able to promote independent learning or learning on our own, which is remote learning or self-paced learning or a tailored type of learning for each of the different students or learner. As we embark and cope with this COVID-19, we should always promote self-care. And lastly, we become vigilant because uh, when we talk about COVID-19 and it is a remote learning, there is a great need for authentic assessment. We become more aware that some students may be dishonest. Some students may, because of different circumstances, may plagiarize or copy and paste the work of other individuals. And lastly, since we are not there physically as teachers to them, they may experience burnout. Okay, now, so these are the different concepts that we will be discussing for Unit 3. We have learning, metacognition, self-efficacy, which will also discuss self-esteem and self-confidence, goal setting, learning theories, motivation, and the different theories of motivation, mindset. Then we'll have a pause and then we will continue this later. We will also discuss stress and wellness. Okay, so before we start, I guess you are familiar with the song of Pussycat Dolls when I grew up. When I first listened to this particular video, I was quite amazed and shocked when they were singing the phrases when I grew up as if they have not grown. Okay, anyways, in a higher perspective, we should ask or we should not ask kids or young students like you what you want to be when you grow up. But instead, the question should be, what problems do you want to solve? This particular move, this particular move, sorry, huh? this particular move would change the conversation from what do I want to work for to what do I need to learn to be able to do that? Okay, so it's more proactive, it's more constructive, it is more in relation to the needs of time. Okay. So we we'll start now with the first concept that we will be discussing learning. First and foremost, as a background, learning, life in college is not easy. I do not want to give you a good picture, uh, what I said, a uh, rose colored picture rose colored or you see college as in a rose colored glasses but instead i would like you to look at college as something which is not really easy college is coping with a lot of things while you study you look at the picture you manage your time you find ways to 
work because of the remote learning. You go to different places where there is ghost signal or you make to create a makeshift shelter so that you would be protected from rain and sun so that you could cope with everything. But despite all of this, we appreciate students who continue to work, who continue to study, because for them, learning is everything. Learning is everything every day. Okay. Next. So what is learning? Learning is defined as a permanent change in behavior as a result of experiences. So there are three things you have to remember here. First, it is a permanent. When we say permanent, it is consistent. What you have learned in the past, you should know it now, and you should know them in the future. Okay, there may be a debate for this because of our memory. Do things that we have learned in the past would definitely stay with us. It is just that we have to get the right cues or stimulus so that we could retrieve those different information. Second thing that you have to remember about learning is a change in behavior. When we say change in behavior, something had happened. Meaning, for example, from not knowing how to ride the bike to now learning how to pedal the bike and balance at the moment would be a learning process. Third concept that you have to remember regarding learning is that it is a result of experiences. Experiences would be our best teacher. We learn things by doing things. We learn things through our senses. We do not learn things because it is a result of maturation or development. Like for example, if you have good muscles, parang may six abs ka, okay din yung iyong limbs, yung iyong paa, then you could be a good runner. No. Learning does not entail maturation or development. You'd become a good runner if you keep on practicing through experiences. Uh, keep on practicing, which is a experience. Okay. So there are different concepts in the learning process. There are five. We will discuss them one after the other. Okay. So the first one is learning is active. Uh, for those who are K-drama okay, addicts like me, I guess you are familiar with Junjian. And one of her latest drama would be The Legend of the Blue Sea, wherein she was a mermaid in that particular drama. And she was able to know things about the world by downloading those information from a computer, which is hooked in the internet. Okay. How I wish learning could be this simple. But learning is an active process, which means that we need to concentrate in order to learn things. We need to keep on trying to know things. We have to be motivated, interested. We have to set our goals. We have to be satisfied with the things that we want to do. So learning is an active process. You cannot place a USB and put it in your brain and then every information that you want will be downloaded. Learning does not happen in that way. Okay, so what do we, uh, to better explain this when we talk about learning, information would pass through your sensory, uh, sensory sense organs, like for example, your eyes. So the data would be brought to your retina and then it would be transmitted in your visual cortex. From the visual cortex, it will not just stay there, it will be processed in the different parts of the brain, particularly in the memory part, so that you could remember the letter B. This is just one of the explanation of active learning. There are still others as we go along the different parts and different slides of our lecture. Okay, next. Second, learning builds on prior knowledge, meaning learning is based from what we have learned in the past. For example, the things that we had learned in our school, senior high school or junior high school, from our experiences, from the things that our family had taught us. So learning is based from previous experiences or knowledge. Okay, let me give you a concrete example. In uh, uh, PJ's cognitive development theory, a child, for example, at the onset, he would cuddle a pet and he would say doggy because she had learned from, private, from previous experiences that this is a doggy. Okay, clear? So when he see or when she sees a cat, she would call it doggy. Why? Because from previous experiences, everything 
any animal, a pet is called doggy. That is a simulation. However, since the new information is, uh, is since the new information does no longer fit into the old information, the father would teach her new one. She, the father would say, this is a doggy. What you're seeing at the moment is a cat. So she's learning to differentiate a cat from a doggy. And we call that as accommodation according to PJ. Okay, now, number three. Learning occurs in a complex social process. So when we talk about learning, learning, there are things that we could learn on our own. Learners can do without assistance. There are things that we could not really learn no matter how much we try. That's why in order to learn the things that we do not know, we need some assistance from other people. Okay. Now that we are in the pandemic, there are new things that we're learning. TikTok University, as we finally call it, and even YouTube University would be a good assistance. Without the teacher, sometimes we go to TikTok and YouTube University. You could learn a lot of things in TikTok and YouTube. So I guess you could go there. Okay. So what I'm saying here in, in the learning process, there are students who could learn immediately things. Like for example, this MS Teams. For the MS Teams, some students do not need assistance. Why? Because they are curious enough. They are more techy enough to uh, discover how MS Team works. While for others, they need to watch videos. They need to get instructions from me so that they could learn how to navigate something that they do not know yet at the moment. Okay, next. Four, learning is situated in an authentic context. Meaning, learning is not merely memorizing. That's a wrong thing. Because if you just put the information in your mind, you just try to remember them without connecting it to previous experiences, there's a greater chance that you will forget it immediately. So learning by doing would be a good thing for the learning process. How do we do it? We try to give application or we apply the things that we have learned. How? Through reflection, making some portfolio. In our class, we may be doing some uh, tangible product, cooperative learning, which we will discuss later. And then hopefully, yung dream nating lahat, to be able to bring back, give back to our community what we are learning at the moment. Okay. Next, learning requires learners' motivation and cognitive engagement. Learning without motivation will not happen. Why? As you look into the figure here, as a student enrolls in a certain class and he interacts with his classmates and the instructor and the subject material, he is influenced by his motivation, the things that would interest him. If he would say, I would have to enroll in this class because I would like to finish this course so that I could graduate later on after four to five years, then that's motivation. It, he is also influenced by other personal characteristics like learning style and other uh, characteristics. He may also be influenced by course factors, like for example, what type of course is that? Is it a difficult or a easy one? Or instructor factor. If they do not like the teacher, they do not like the way she looks or he looks, then it could influence the learning process. So what I'm saying is you have to like your teacher. You have to like me in order to enjoy what we're doing at the moment. Okay. Next, learning is also a cognitive engagement. So let me just remove and displace my hand. Okay. So learning is a cognitive engagement, meaning if it will be a positive engage, a positive cognitive, passive cognitive engagement, we merely listen and receive the information. But if it is an active one, we look into the relationship of that thing that we are learning at the moment with other information that we already know, prior knowledge, or information that we are receiving at the moment. Example, how is psychology, or sorry, how is GE self connected with my purposive communication subject? Okay. The third step would be constructive, meaning you're trying to understand more, evaluate more, and generate new information about what you are learning. The first step that we usually do here is 
how can I define a certain word? If I would use my own words, is my definition correct? And then my aim for our class is that for your cognitive engagement to be interactive, there would be ways wherein you have dialogues, conversation with your groups so that you may share your idea, which may be different and definitely it would be different from the ideas of your classmate. Try to find ways a middle ground or if not, try to accept each other's idea and find solution because these ideas could be ways for you to find solution. Okay, commercial break. Okay, next, metacognition. So for metacognition, metacognition would mean uh, thinking about thinking. Cognition would deal with thinking. Meta would be more of trying to be aware, trying to evaluate and conceptualize about thinking. So for metacognition, if you're doing this, here's a manifestation. Metacognition, ano ba yung metacognition? If you're saying those things, then you are trying to figure out the definition. Okay. Metacognition reminds me of, for example, let's say metacognition reminds me of a concept we're in. If you say meta, it's a collection, it's a concept, it's a connection of the different information. Then that is metacognition. Okay, let me explain it very well. Okay, so for metacognition, there are two aspects. The first one is you have to be aware of what you are thinking. When we say awareness, the student have knowledge about metacognitive processes. What are the different things that my mind is doing at the moment? And try to look at some strategies so that I could better understand the concept. That is awareness. For metacognition regulation, you are now controlling or managing this mental processes. Like for example, you're doing planning, action, and evaluation. Okay. A concrete one is this one. Okay. So for example, in our class, I ask you to group yourselves. There would be groupings later on, and then there would be tasks to be given. When you receive the task, when you read about the task, you would say, what is this task? What can I do about this task? What is expected of me from this task? That is assessing the task. Then you plan now as a group. Uh, these are the things that we need to do in order to solve the problem or in order to answer the question that mom had posted. You be the one to research. You be the one to collate. You will be the one to make the presentation. That is a plan. How would you apply it? How would you apply those three strategies? Ah, we would be meeting online via, for example, FBGC. Okay, we create our own groups or so that mom could see us, could tell us, uh, could uh, determine what we're doing. Then we could create another channel here in our MS Teams. And then when you would present those things and I will give you feedback, you would have to say, ah, this is the reason why we succeeded. Ah, these are the things that we could do so that we could improve. That's metacognition process. Being aware and regulating our thinking. Okay. Next concept is self-efficacy. In self-efficacy theory, according to Bray and McPasley, we'll use this one, Self-efficacy is developed in this manner. So let's have an analogy. A certain child crossing a bridge. Okay. At the onset, before he would cross the bridge, he would become cautious. He may be curious, but he's cautious. And then a teacher has to guide them. Okay, clear. So as they move forward, maybe a few steps towards the bridge, they would they would now have a, create a strong attachment or a relationship with the teacher, meaning they would say, ah, the teacher could be trusted. Then maybe I could cross the bridge. We call that as self-esteem. Self-esteem would be an evaluation of others regarding what you can do. Okay. As you move along the bridge, step forward, take other steps, you're now believing in your ability, self-confidence. As you persist through that particular challenge, you become successful. And you would say, let me just remove my head. I move my head. I did it. 
So there's perseverance. So when we talk about self-efficacy, as Bandura would define it, it refers to individual's belief in his or her capacity to execute behaviors necessary to produce specific performance attainment. This means that self-efficacy is our judgment of what we think we can do. Okay, clear. It's our judgment. It's a confidence of trying to exert effort to what we can do. It is trying to evaluate what could be our sources of motivation, behavior, and social environment. As a self, a cognitive self-evaluation, we look at can we manage this goal? How much energy do I need to put into it so that I could reach my goals? Or some, am I really good at it? Likelihood of attaining particular levels of behavioral performance. That's why some people would say, I am self-efficacious, high self-efficacy in math, but not in English. Okay, so self-efficacy would just be a judgment. I got this, sabi mo. Okay, judgment of what? Okay, so there are different influences. First one would be verbal persuasion. Evaluation of others like encouragement or discouragement could increase our self-efficacy, particularly of important individuals like our teachers, our parents, our peers. We also increase our self-efficacy by our performance outcome. For example, if you had done something and the consequence would be positive, then you would say, ha, huh, I am good at it. I got this. That is a judgment of what you can do. Okay, clear? So outcome performance. For example, if you took the math exam and you keep on having high scores on math exam, then you would say, ah, I am self-efficacious in math. Okay, vicarious experience is that you increase your efficacy by looking into the experiences of other people and following it. If other people would succeed, then I might succeed in this one. And physiological feedback could deal with our emotional arousal. Remember, sometimes there's the gut feeling that if it's our first time to do things, you're quite nervous, but you know you would succeed if you are calm at the same time. Parang lang sa maximum. Those would be physiological feedback. Okay. Now, let's try to do this. Never have I ever won. Felt so lost in my life. Two, never have I ever come in late for class or meeting. Three, never have I ever skip or do not attend classes. Four, never have I ever cheated in school. Five, never have I ever failed in my exams. Six, never have I ever missed my deadlines in school. Seven, Never have I ever struggled in school. Eight, never have I ever regret decisions in my life. Nine, never have I ever felt something, someone missing in my life. And ten, never have I ever planned for something in my life. If you never had done this, most of us would say, yes, I never have I. I would say no. May mga times na nangyari sa akin ito. Okay. It's not always true for me. Those things. Okay. Or, have you ever, one, have you ever spent time thinking over what you really want to do in life? Most often than not, we do that. Have you ever been asked to do something you don't want to do in life? Of course. Have you ever lived a life that you want? Have you ever worked on something or someone you really desire? Or have you ever want to achieve something in life, even as a student? Most of us had been thinking this. And the sum of all of those thinking would be our goals. So what is our goal? So what is goal? Goal is something which is measurable, observable, result of several objectives that can be accomplished in a given time frame. It is a desired result or outcome of what we wish to achieve or it could be an aim. As Lack and Lachman would say, goal could have three processes, the concept, the construct, and the proposition. Okay. Medyo mahirap i-explain ito kasi you have to, uh, basta mahirap explain ito. Let me go to uh, 
clearer one. Okay, so when we make our goal, our goal should be smart or if not smarter. Smart goals would be first, it should be specific. We should answer the question, what, who, where, and why. Measurable, to what extent can you evaluate your goal? Achievable, it is, some, is the goal something which is challenging? You make use action-oriented verbs. Or is it relevant? Is it aligned with the things that I really want to do? And time down. Okay. So here are some examples of bad smart goals and good smart goals. So for example, some of you had this a few months back as a goal. I want to go to college. Okay. A good smart goal would be by January 1st of 2021, I will have researched three colleges and apply to two colleges that I want to attend. I will attend one of the colleges and I am accept, uh, colleges I am accepted in and register for my first course and start by September to October 2021. My college plan fits with my 10-year career plan. So it's specific. It is a smart one. Or you would say, I want to have a lot of money. That's not a smart goal. A smarter goal would be, I want to make 1 million specific within time bound. 10 years by starting how internet business or marketing business selling personal development products all over the world and by providing live coaching consultancy conducting live seminars so this would be some of the activities that you could do uh, here are some other examples of smart goals. okay let's go now to learning there are a lot of theories of learning it could be from behavioral perspective, here the cognitive perspective, constructivist perspective, or the humanistic perspective. But we'll make it very simple. Okay, so for our learning, we would focus on Thorndike's law of learning. So for Thorndike, he was able to derive some of the laws of learning through a certain experiment with a cat trapped in a box with a door. And if the door opens, the cat could be able to get a reward, which is food. So when we talk about law of effect, it would be consequences. So as the cat would experiment and pull the string, the door, door uh, trap door would be open, then he would get the food. Law of effect. We do things as a consequence, or we look at the consequence of what we are doing. Usually, we look at positive consequences. Law of readiness. The cat definitely will not pull the string if he is not yet hungry. He will keep on pulling the strings if he is hungry. So meaning, if you are not feeling good or well at that moment, you may not enjoy the lecture because you will not engage into it. Okay. Law of readiness. Law of exercise. If you keep on doing things, you keep on succeeding, then you better you are learning something. Okay. There are different theories of motivation, but I, what I would like to focus on would be Maslow's hierarchy of needs. The first two, biological, physiological needs, and safety needs are biological, are ways for us to survive. These are biological or physiological needs. Belongingness, love needs, and esteem needs would be psychological needs. We, these are things that could be accomplished with the help of other people. And lastly, the trans, uh, sorry, cognitive needs, aesthetics need, self-actualization and transcendence would be activities or this are needs that would tend to reach our potential. Okay, so there are also two aspects of motivation. First one would be extrinsic outside of us. For example, the reward that we get the recognition, social recognition that we get. Or it would be something which is intrinsic within ourselves. Like, for example, what we're thinking, what we're feeling, or what we think to be what we need to do. Or sometimes it's our need for a spirituality, religious one. Or it is a biological or physiological needs. Okay. Uh, like what I've said, there are different theories, one of which would be this self-regulation theory by... Zimmerman, we will not discuss that. I'll just present it to you. Another theory would be self-determination theory by Ryan and Desi, wherein they said that there are three human basic needs, competence, 
doing well in what you're doing, effective, or the need to control, the need to be dependent, or independent, uh, the need to be independent, and relatedness, the need for connection or having some relationship. Okay. We also have expectancy theory. We do things because of our belief in ourselves, as well as the value that we attach to the goal that we would like to achieve. Okay. So uh, here, last, second to the last would be growth mindset. So for growth versus fixed mindset, what I would like you to remember, class, is that growth, a fixed mindset would be our default. Usually would say, ah, ito lang yung kaya kong ganyan. But as you learn things, you develop growth mindset. Wherein challenges should not be something that could be considered as a predator mean. Your potential is predator mean. You could no longer change it. You could no longer improve. But having a growth mindset could help you look at failure as an opportunity to grow. And lastly, that's it. Thank you very much and have a great day.